Holy Spirit, we, uh, we're we going to see in Genesis 1 how you, you hovered over the, the unformed waters of creation. The, your presence there in the chaos. And we recognize that you still do that in us. Not just that you hover, but that you enter into our own lives. Where, let's be honest, there's probably a lot of chaos sometimes. And yet your guiding and leading hand helps to bring us out of the darkness into God's great light. We pray for that this morning. We pray for illumination, that you would enlighten us so that when we're reading and considering the words in our Bibles, that we're not just thinking of them as some religious text, but that they become the living word among us, shaping us to be more like Jesus. And so if there's anything merely human in this time, Lord, we pray that that would be forgotten and only that which is from you, Lord, would remain and grow and take root. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So when you've been a minister for a while, you, uh, you collect a lot of spiritual jokes. People like, people like to tell them to me. And some of them are just pretty awful. The one I want to share with you is actually one of my favorites. I don't think this is awful at all. I think this is great. It's the story of, of a scientist who's very full of himself, and he finally thinks that he's got this whole process of creation figured out. And so he says to God, okay, God, I, I, I've got this. I'm going to challenge you to uh, a contest. I, I'm, I know that science has progressed far enough to where we can create man just like you did, probably better than you did. And God says, all right, we'll do that. Let's, let's start with the creation of man. Go ahead. And so the scientist bends down and he starts scooping up dirt and God says, whoa, 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 whoa. Get your own dirt. <laughs> I love that joke. I love that idea that God creates everything. That one of the differences in the in, in the biblical account of creation from all of the other ancient Near Eastern creation epics is that God is there first. In fact, as far as I know, it is the only uh, creation text that starts with the existence of God as opposed to the existence of stuff. The, the Babylonians uh, famously, they, they, their creation epic starts, in the beginning, there was chaos and their God crawls out of the chaos and then turns around and calls other little G-gods out of the chaos. And then they, they scoop up the stuff that's there and they shape it. To which the biblical account is response. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get your own dirt. Start with nothing and then create. And then let's talk about who's God and who's not. In the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at, well, frankly, some American ideas that are off. They're just skewed a little off about God. I have read that many Americans' favorite verse is, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> not in the Bible. Not It's not there. And yet... They don't know. So we're going to be looking at some foundational truths that are in Scripture for the next few weeks. And today, we're going to start off in Genesis. Um, if you turn with me in your pew Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, this is page 1. Page 1. We're starting right at the beginning. What is God's job? What is God? really up to? Well, let's take a look at uh, verses 1 through 5 to kind of get us into this. 
In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, the reason I'm not going to go through the entire uh, creation account is because all of the, the structure of the creation account is just in those first five verses. God had an idea, figured out that something needed to be done, spoke it into being. So what is God's job? God's work is the creator. God's work is the creator. He makes stuff. He doesn't fashion from stuff that's already existing. No, 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 no. He makes from the beginning. God created. He didn't shape or craft what was already there. And so here's a foundational truth. God is first. God is first. Now, I'm going to say something that might strike you funny, and I don't mean for it to do so, but I, I need you to hear this. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, especially chapter 1, is not about how God created the universe. It's not about how God created the universe. It's about who created the universe in the first place. That's the point that this whole first chapter is intended to answer. And God said, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God made it. God spoke. God spoke. God spoke. God spoke. Over and over, we see that same structure being riffed on repeatedly just to make sure that we see the underlining in Scripture. God is at work. God is first. And without God's intervention, creation was, verse 2, Empty, formless, void is a great word. You know what? We're empty too. Without God showing up and, and providing structure, we're, we're empty. A, a, a mathematician named Pascal famously said, I think in the 1700s, that we've all got a God-shaped hole in our lives. And the people will do Anything they can to fill up that hole except actually go to God and say, you win. We're empty too. And, and notice verse 3, the thing that, that gets repeated over and over, and God said. God spoke everything into being. This, this idea, this is called a, ex nihilo. God creates out of nothing. Creating out of nothing is hard. <laughs> a little while ago, um, when Janica was getting married, uh, she picked out bridesmaids' dresses, and Elizabeth got her bridesmaids' dress, and it wasn't it wasn't it ripped. It was so we got another one, and I I pieced together from the two dresses one that she could wear. And we've got Easter coming up really soon, and I had a whole bunch of these scraps left over. And I thought, it might be kind of cool if I could take these scraps and make a dress for Belle so that mom and daughter could have matching dresses. Because it's been a long time since I made Easter dresses for my little girls. <laughs> so I got a hold of the scraps. I took them all apart. I asked Elizabeth to go downstairs and get me another dress that I could just kind of use as a real basic thumbnail sketch pattern. Cut it all apart, put it back together. It's really cute. I can't wait for you guys to see it, it's awesome. I have so much left over, I think I'm gonna make Josh a tie. <laughs> 
making stuff out of stuff that's already there, challenging but not impossible. Making a dress, I, I, I didn't have to weave that cloth. I didn't have to go find the stuff to make the dye. I didn't have to create the stuff out of nothing. God does that. God does that in ways that we can't do that. He spoke things into being. So here's a point to, to hold on to. God speaks. That's his job. Our job? Listen. Verse 4. Uh, God saw that it was, what's it say? Good. God saw that it was good. Now think about it. When he creates this, when he creates light, and God saw that it was good, there was no one else to see it. God's the only one in existence at the time, and he makes light. And the text is kind of cool. He's like, yep, that's pretty neat. I'd love that. God existing only being in the universe, creates light and thinks, I'm going to keep going. This, this, this is good. God determines what is good. God alone determines what is good. God determines what is good. Verse 5. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. He called the light day. He called the darkness night. God determines what is, period. God determines what is. God makes what he wants to make. God is doing what he wants to do. He's the one who calls out what will be and what part it's going to play. And I'm really underlining this because, frankly, there's this idea that's floating around in Western society that says it's your job to determine what your reality is. It's your job to look in the mirror and tell yourself that you are loved and you are good and you are worthy and... No, that's a lie. That is not true. God determines what is and God determines what is good. And he made you on purpose. Nobody is an accident. One of the things that's been really fascinating is to watch a certain young woman go through this educational process and learn a lot about musical theory that she didn't know before. And musical theory, you can get really into it. It, get, it can get very complex. And the neat thing about it is you learn what all of the quote-unquote rules are for musical theory so that you can intelligently break them. That's what jazz is. You know what all of the structure is. And then you intentionally figure out something else to do with it. You are God's jazz. God knows the rules for what people are like, and yet he riffs. He improvises. He creates each of you as a wonderful and unique. There is no one like you in the universe. You are an individual expression of God's love, not just for you, but for everyone else. That might seem like a lot, but you know you can basically turn to the person next to you and say, I'm God's gift for you. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them, I'm God's gift for you. And then you can say right back, well, I'm the rapping baby. <laughs> you are God's gift to the world, to a watching world. So what's our job? That's what the New Testament passage is. So if you will turn with me into uh, the New Testament, 1 T Timothy chapter 6. We'll look at our response. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll pick this up at verse 11. This is on page 1850 in your pew Bible. What's our job? God's job is the work of the Creator. 
our job? Let's look at verse 11 through 16. But you, O man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. God's job is the work of the, as the creator. Our job is our commitment as the created. Our commitment as the created. There are certain responses that we are to live out. Now, when he mentions all this, but you, man of God, flee from all this. The all this is a reference to uh, the, the first part of that chapter, verses, oh, what, 3 through 10. And they describe false doctrines, specifically false doctrines that are designed to get money out of the taught into the teacher's pockets. And from this, we are to flee. Now, always remember that when we read specifically like 1 Timothy and Titus, that these are these are correspondence letters. These are letters from Paul to a specific guy, to Timothy. Now, the, the premises, the, the, the morals in these are so good that we're, we benefit if we follow these as well. But this was really targeted at Timothy, a young man who's been put in charge of a, of a new congregation. He's supposed to grow that congregation as best he can. And he's being warned, don't get so wrapped up in money that it will take, because it'll take you off course. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, it says in verse 10. So be really careful about that. And if you hear a teacher that starts talking about, well, you need to sow your faith. You need to send me a certain amount of money and God will bless you because of that. You need to they, they love the phrase, sow your seed. It's got nothing to do with seed. They, if you sent them a package of seeds, they'd be upset. They want cold, hard cash. They want a check. Give me your credit card number. That's what they want. If you, if, if you ever hear me start to talk like that, fire me. I'm not kidding. That's a huge indicator of somebody who has gone off into heresy. That addiction to money. Stay away from that. Flee from that. Flee from the greedy is what we're to do. There's the lesson that we can take away from that. If you meet the greedy and they're supposedly in some kind of spiritual authority, nope. Don't listen. Not a good, not a good idea. Focus on the eternal. Verse 12. Fight the good fight. Take hold of the eternal life, not the temporary one. Now, here's the thing. We live in a temporary life. We, we live in a world that breaks. Things break. Entropy is not just a suggestion. <laughs> it's a law of thermodynamics, okay? Things wind down, including our knees, our hips. <laughs> The, the very tabernacles in which we are housed break down over time. And that's not anything we can stop. And so we've got to focus on our eternal life. This part that we're living in the here and the now is just the tip of our eternal life. You are living as, love this word, an aglet. The aglet is that little tiny piece of sticky plastic that's at the very end of your shoelace that lets you get into 
lets you stuff that thing into the hole. You, this life, this aglet life that we live, gets us into eternal life. And then it goes on and on and on. Verse 13. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, make a good confession. Confess Christ. Beware this. There is a thing in uh, this American heresy called to, I wrote it down, decree and declare. I decree and declare that God is going to send me, you know, uh, 300 bucks in the mail. And it's, it's my words have power because God spoke everything into being and God made us in his image, Genesis 126. And so since I'm in the image of God and God is a creator and he spoke everything into being, I can do that too. And so I decree and declare that I'm going to get 300 bucks in the mail next week. No. No, it doesn't work like that. God determines what is, not us. Some years ago, I was at a, I was at a hotel. I happened to be uh, away at school for um, a Greek class, gr- Greek intensive. And in the hotel, there was this big meeting that was happening and It smelled like Amway. I'm sorry. It didn't smell like Amway because Amway actually has a real scent. No, it it felt like some kind of multi-level marketing thing. And so I came back from dinner and they're they're full on into their rah-rah session. And one guy stands up and he says a phrase that just cut me right to the quick. He's, He's giving his testimony. And he says, I used to be a pastor. You should be very proud of me. I did not walk up and just slap him right there. I did not do that. I let him go on. He says, I used to be a pastor and I was always sad that I couldn't provide for my wife. And then I joined this program and now I can give her everything she wants. So I waited for the guy. And after he was all done and the meeting was breaking up, I caught him. I said, so um, I really kind of want to talk to you about this. I used to be a pastor thing. And he goes, oh, okay. He thinks I'm a recruit. He thinks I want to be in this thing. So we, I gave him my number and he called me a couple of days later. And we met for a Coke. And he went through his whole pitch. And he said, so what do you think? And I said, honestly, I think it's really inefficient and pretty foolish. I don't think anybody had ever told him that. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, okay, let's just go for an example. Let's talk about a computer, okay? Let's say that you decide that you want a computer. You're saying that if I invested in your system, if I did all your stuff, then I could make a bunch of money and I could buy a computer whenever I want it. He goes, yes, it's exactly. I said, that's the problem. That's inefficient. What do you mean it's inefficient? I said, so here's how it works for me. If I think I want a computer, I tell my father, Father, God, I think I want a computer. If you want me to have a computer, send me a computer. That works. And he goes, really? I said, yeah, I have 10 in my garage right now. (laughs) Computers come into me. I fix them up. I turn around and I give them away. I can't find enough people to give away this stuff. He didn't know what to do with that. If God wants to prosper you. You don't have to decree and declare. You ask. If any of you lacks anything, you ask God. If you lack wisdom, James says, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. Not ask for stuff. You ask for wisdom. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not give you the objects of your desires. He changes your heart itself. He changes what you want to want the stuff that he wants you to want. And verse 14. So if we are to flee the greedy, if we're supposed to run from the greedy, what are we supposed to run to? What are we supposed to pursue? Verse 14. Keep this 
command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pursue Jesus. We chase Christ. That's what we're to do. I, just because I married the woman of my dreams doesn't mean I stopped dating the woman of my dreams. You keep chasing. And then verses 15 and 16, we end where we begin. With the reminder that God is first in all things. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might. How long? How long? Forever. God is first in all things. You ever feel like your spiritual life is stagnant? Does it feel like maybe there's not much growth happening? And then you're always feeling like you need something more? When we get like that, it could be because we've substituted old, stale, false faith for the living water of God's word. When we're drinking from the well of living water that's never going to run dry, our soul's thirst can be truly satisfied. If we decide that we want something more exciting or enriching, more focused on feeding our faces than our faith, we're going to end up spiritually famished. So don't settle for any alternative theories that are based in fallen flesh than on the true and tested teaching of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we don't want to settle for mere platitudes, for ideas that can be easily packaged and put on a book with some shiny face on the cover. Because frankly, the only face we want to see is yours. And Scripture says, we can't see you, so we have to walk in faith. Draw us to yourself, Jesus. Help us to understand what that means. We ask this all in your name. Amen.